Hey, deserving listeners, it's just me today. I thought I would answer some of your patron emails. This first email is from patron Leo. He says, I am a gay 30-year-old male whose attachment style is painfully preoccupied. (laughs) That's painfully preoccupied. And by listening to your deep dives, I've learned a lot about the reasons why I feel so much distress during my romantic relationships. Oh, good for you, Leo. However, there is something I still don't understand. If I'm aware of what's going on in those moments of pain, why is it so hard for my subconscious mind to understand that too and stop suffering and pursuing? Will the conscious and subconscious minds ever be on the same page or do we just have to learn self-soothing skills and apply them forever? End of email. It's a great question, Leo. And I'll answer it by pointing out that if you listen to the episodes with Bob, he 100% understands the attachment disruption and injury and traumas that he's been through and how it affects him and how it distorts him and how it will give him urges or perspectives or distortions. And yet he cannot uh, exert control over his feelings because nobody can. Uh, The solution long-term is that with awareness that you have, which is great, you are able to attenuate or mitigate or lessen the damage that your impulses or your distortions or your subconscious interpretation, you're able to lessen the damage that that will do. For example, when you're with your romantic partner and you feel some sort of threat, and let's say that it isn't actually a threat to your attachment, but your body, your mind, your subconscious mind is interpreting it that way, and you notice that you're starting to get angry or you're pursuing or you're starting to become hypervigilant and overfocus or whatever. And then you have enough in- insight to say, whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait. Actually, I don't think this is actually a threat and I think I'm overreacting or I'm interpreting it in a distorted way. Well, the feeling will still be there. It'll be raging, that feeling. <laughs> but you're conscious mind, your executive control, is keeping it at bay to some extent. You're still going to suffer. You know, as you say, you're suffering and then you pursue and you can engage in self-soothing. Yeah, you can take deep breaths. You can pursue in a way that is more healthy. Like you just tell your partner, hey, I'm having one of those moments. Can you reassure me? Otherwise, I might spin out of control and start attacking you emotionally. So you could help me out, could, could I get a hug, or you can reach out to a friend or whatever. It's, it's not going to take away the feeling, but it can keep it in check, and it can prevent you from shooting yourself in the foot by pushing people away, that kind of thing, right? But the long-term is uh, facilitated, the long-term change is facilitated through corrective experiences, and I'm guessing you're at the beginning of that journey, you know, ten years from now, if you worked on a, if you work on a lot of earned security and healing, where you have relationships that are secure and non hurtful and dedicated and loyal and ongoing, then your subconscious, your body, will rewrite how the world works. Will learn a new lesson through that experience, and through that experience, your body will become less reactive. So you know that that's that's the plan. But yeah, this notion that somehow knowing and you know even going through a fair amount of therapy that it'll just take away the feeling. I understand why people would want that, and that idea is in our culture. You know, there's just this idea that if you go to therapy for a little bit of time and you figure out what's wrong, then you're cured. You know, you, you don't have anything more to do. It's a destructive notion. It's overblown. And, and I'll even go further by saying, even if Bob does a lot more therapy, because he's done a lot of really focused, really excellent therapy, that there's not enough years left in his life to fully recover. And he's still suffering to a great degree. And he's been through, I don't know, something like 35 years of of really intensive therapy. And he's a therapist himself. And he knows this stuff forwards and backwards. And he's still suffering a lot. And that sucks. It's unfair. It's demoralizing. Bob will say it's worth it because if he didn't do it, he'd be a lot worse off for sure. But, you know, 
people that specialize in this, like Bob and I, will fully know not to expect that people, even with the best of therapy and they work really hard and they absorb things really well, with a certain level of relational harm that happens early in life, there's there's nothing that can be done to get rid of a significant portion of it. Meaning that, I guess if we go with percentages, I, I would say that for people that go through the severe trauma and abuse that Bob went through, you could expect with very focused therapy and working really hard for someone to get like, I don't know, 60%, 70% down the road. But even that last 30% is a lot of suffering and a lot of distortion and a lot of pain and a lot of destructive urges like to attack or run away. And maybe that's optimistic, maybe 50%. I don't know. It's terrible. What we should be doing as a society is preventing these traumas from happening to begin with by having programs that help parents and by education and having a culture, moving our culture, our society in a culture of more connection, more extended family or extended community. Because when you have a child that is experiencing an abusive parent, the chance of them having severe complications from it are lessened if they are if they're connected with grandparents and aunts and uncles and other figures that they can go to you know i'll i'll hear that i'll someone will tell me about how horrible their parents were and how abusive they were and yet as an adult i'm looking at them and i'm like how how did you manage to emerge from that childhood being so healthy and they'll talk about a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle or a neighbor or somebody that was there for them. Um, maybe sometimes an older sibling or sometimes just two siblings supported each other as they went through it. So if we have a community and we have, it takes a village mentality, then we can greatly reduce these rates. But what's done is done. And I'm so sorry that happened to you, Leo. All right. This next email is from patron and YouTube member Fema from the UK, good old Fema. She says, Hi, Kirk. On your podcast, you have talked about bipolar disorder being treated effectively only through psychiatry and medication. Yeah, so I think I have said such a thing. It's not really reflective of how I think, and I shouldn't be so brief when I say such things. Of course, other things in, in your email, you suggest other things that you can do, like therapy, eating well, sleeping well, exercise, that kind of thing support. Absolutely. All those things should be considered and tried and used. And I think what I'm getting at when I'm saying something along the lines of, look, therapy, talk therapy isn't going to help if you have bipolar. What, what I'm trying to get at is there are some people and maybe ideas within our culture that talk therapy is the first thing you do with all of the labels in the DSM. And that's not the way that I approach these kinds of things. If someone came to me with bipolar and they didn't have a psychiatrist, I would say, you really have to see a psychiatrist. You have to get that ball rolling. You have to start going down the road of trying different medications and figuring out how that's going to work for you. Along the way, I can certainly provide talk therapy, we can work on things that are independent of your bipolar because it's not like someone is entirely embodied by their bipolar. <laughs> you know, they have relationships and traumas and schemas just like everybody else does. So we do that. Also, um, one's symptoms can be exacerbated and even created by stress or by other kinds of issues, schemas and reactivity attachment issues, for sure. And if you're going through the ups and downs of something like bipolar, it can put a lot of strain on your attachments and you can suffer. And so therapy can help with that as well. But I guess I'm, uh, when I'm talking about this, I'm being a little flippant about it because I, I've run up against a lot of people who will claim that, uh, well, I guess it's kind of two groups of people. One group is some people that I've treated with bipolar will tell me that they hate psychiatry and 
they're not going to do it. And there's a lot of reasons why someone would take that position, some of them more legitimate than others. And almost everyone that I've treated and everyone that I've heard of that will do that, what will happen is that they will have uh, a period, an episode of severe mania, and their life will completely spin out of control. And eventually down the line, they will realize that even though medication sucks on a variety of levels, it is the only way to make their life work overall. Um, not all the time, certainly, but that is the case. So I think when I hear people saying that they don't want to do medication and they want to do therapy or other kinds of things or diet, I, I'm reacting against that. And if you have a family member or you have bipolar yourself, you probably know about this phenomenon. It's well known that people with bipolar will, uh, uh, you know, I, this is anecdotal, but I would say on average, people with bipolar will go through one or two periods of their life post, you know, post diagnosis and post being given medication where they stop taking their medication because they don't like the side effects or they're convincing themselves that their bipolar is cured or they miss the hypomania or whatever. And every case that I've worked with, they will regret having done that in a big way. And so I think I'm in a brief way reacting against that. There, there's also another group of people that I'm reacting against who just think that therapy is the thing that you do when you have a mental problem of any sort and that that's all you need to do, which is not always the case. I've had people come to me with bipolar and will try to fix their issues, try to work on their issues, and it can be really, really hard <laughs> because their perspective and their point of view and their behavior is being filtered through their mood, which filters things into being very different than what they are. You know, I had a client once who was becoming increasingly violent with what he was telling me that, you know, the stories he was telling me was he was becoming increasingly violent, like severely violent with people in his life, people he worked with, and he didn't have any problem with it. And I'm pretty sure, I don't know, but I'm pretty sure it was largely fueled by his mood episodes, meaning that in another point in his mood swing, he would not have done those things or thought it was okay to do those things. People with bipolar aren't inherently violent. I'm not saying that, but it was hard to work with him and, and he was refusing to take medication. And at some point I had to, well, it's a long story, but we essentially terminated pretty early in the treatment, not because I kicked him out. I mean, we just basically decided that this wasn't the best venue, but if that didn't happen, in all likelihood, I would have had that ultimatum with him that if he wanted to continue seeing me, he had to, at the very least, have some ongoing consultations with a psychiatrist that knew what they were doing around bipolar. Not that he had to take medication, because I can't know what that consultation will conclude, but that he needs to do that. And if the recommendation is that he take medication, then he's going to have to follow that recommendation. Otherwise, it's going to be hard for me to help him, you know, because he was really asking for me to help him. And, and um, but yeah, if I'm saying just blanket statements, Fema, and I, and I can hear myself saying it, <laughs> um, that's stupid. That's just wrong. It's not even how I think. <laughs> so thanks for telling me about that. Another email here is Patron Arnett from New York. She says, are you familiar with the Hero Journey Club? Hero Journey Club. What are your thoughts about this type of service? It seems to be like a blurry line to me, but but maybe you could illuminate. And so Patron Arnett provides the following quotes from their website. Okay. Hero Journey Club. So Arnett's like, what's going on with this Hero Journey Club? It seems unethical. So this is from their website. Hero Journey Club offers a unique weekly subscription service for group mental health sessions in various video games, including Minecraft, Star, Stardew Valley, Animal Crossing, and many, many more. Okay, so let's go over this. Hero Journey Club offers a unique weekly subscription service for group mental health sessions 
in various video games, like Minecraft and so on, in various video games. So you're playing the game, you know, and I know someone who does this work. I had him on the podcast years and years ago about how to use Minecraft in therapy. But uh, so I'm guessing it's something like that, but group mental health sessions, uh, unique weekly subscription service to, it's not unique because I know people that do that kind of work, you know, game to grow, that sort of thing. Um, I would say it's rare, but it's not unique, but group mental health sessions. Okay. With a limit of five members per session, these groups are anonymous. Only your discord username and avatar will be shared to other members. Five members, limit of five members per session. These groups are anonymous. So you have group mental health sessions that are anonymous. I mean, maybe they're anonymous to the other participants, but you can't provide a, a clinical service to an anonymous avatar. <laughs> um, but let's go on. Led by trained therapists, okay? So people with, and they have in parentheses, PsyD, licensed marriage and family therapist, licensed clinical social worker, and licensed mental health counselors. Led by trained therapists, so the, and they're saying licensed people, fully licensed people, not even associate license. Led by trained therapists, our sessions provide an engaging and secure environment for discussing and addressing a wide range of mental health issues such as depression, anxiety, addiction, identity, identity, and more. Okay. Hero Journey Club is not suitable, is not, sorry, Hero Journey Club is not a substitute for psychotherapy or medical advice. Not a substitute for psychotherapy, but earlier you're saying it's group mental health sessions. It sounds like therapy. <laughs> Our group sessions are not deep enough to provide any diagnoses or treatments. Hero Journey Club is an additional tool in the mental health toolbox. Okay, well, yeah, uh, might this be a wonderful addition to therapy? Sure, but it, it will obviously attract people that aren't in therapy because if they were in therapy, well, it doesn't sound like they're requiring that people are in therapy. What it sounds like, well, let me read the rest. While our facilitators are licensed therapists, they do not provide psychotherapy in this setting. <laughs> we, okay, so why have licensed therapists then if they're not providing therapy? You wouldn't need therapists if you're not providing therapy. If you're just playing games with people, then you're just playing games. You don't need a licensed therapist to lead that. But earlier in the blurb, you say, it's group mental health sessions, group mental health sessions. How is that not a clinical service? Uh, yeah, this is problematic. They going on, they will help you benefit from group sessions by providing support and steering conversations, but they will not evaluate or diagnose conditions, construct individual treatment plans, prescribe medication or assess and treat crises. Should you need help, we can provide crisis resources, but we are not equipped to address crisis situations. End of email. Yeah, this looks highly problematic. Why have therapists if you're not providing therapy? Why call them group mental health sessions if it's not therapy? Why mention that these groups are designed to address mental health issues such as depression, anxiety, and, and, and addiction when you're saying you're not going to diagnose? How would you know to treat, or how would you know that the, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, that, what I'm guessing happened, and this is just speculation, is that you had a group of people or an organization that had a great idea, which was to provide uh, mental health help to people in a way that was more inviting and, and more in their world. And they're thinking, how do we get these gamers to participate in therapy? Well, what if we did it online? Oh, okay. What if we actually played the games during therapy? Oh, okay. What if we did group therapy so they could interact with other people? Oh, okay. That's great. Let's move forward with that. But then they run into this barrier where they're like, well, if, we're, if this is therapy, we're not licensed to provide therapy for people all over the planet. And there's all these kinds of, you know, different changes around these laws, you know, because in the past, you could only treat people in your state. The state 
in the United States where you're licensed. It, it, it was pretty severe. Like even if your client was in another state, but they were only like a couple miles away because you both lived right on the border, then that could be considered a violation of your license because you're not licensed to treat someone in that state. It kind of depends. And there's all this um, nuance to it and also lack of precedent in the courts. But and things are changing because of the pandemic and things are opening up to some extent. But uh, that was the way it was in the past. And so you could see this organization saying, okay, well, how do we get around all the problems? How do? And, and maybe they even had this idea of like, well, what if we made it anonymous? And you can't have it actually be an- anonymous because you ha- uh, they charge for it. <laughs> um, in the longer email, Arnett gives, there's a price. It's something like 30 bucks or something, a session. And you can't accept cash in the mail. <laughs> so there has to be some way of accepting a payment, which probably carries with it some sort of identification of a person. But anyway, I mean, I guess you can probably... Well, yeah, I mean, you could do Bitcoin, right? Those are anonymous, potentially. Anyway, um, but it sounds like what they're saying is they're offering an anonymous sort of activity where they don't even have to tell the facilitator who they are. And so they had that idea of like, ooh, that would be even more inviting. They wouldn't even have to tell us who they are. Yeah, okay, that's a good idea, but you're not going to be able to provide a clinical service because you have to take names. <laughs> you have to get their address. Like a classic example of where this would go wrong is one of the clients in this group says, I'm going to kill myself and then hangs up. As a clinician, and as, as a clinician for myself, like let's say that I was doing phone therapy or Zoom therapy and I had a client that did that, then it's uh, expected, it's within the standard of care and it's my responsibility. And in some states, it's actually in the law to some extent, or at least the precedent in the courts, that I have a responsibility to do reasonable things to reduce the risk of this person killing themselves. And the thing that I would do is I would look up their address and phone number and email and maybe have an you know, emergency contact in my file. And I would start taking action. I might even just hang up or I might immediately just call 911 and tell the police that someone at this address just threatened to kill himself. You need to do a wellness check or whatever. And I know some people would say that's the, that's a stupid thing to do. And maybe it is, but some police are actually pretty good with this. Some police departments and some individual police officers are not going to go in blazing. At, there are, of course, stories like that, but we are expected to do something, right? I guess some therapists would even drive to their house, right? But that carries with it a whole lot of risks as well. You know, what if they have guns? Do you want to bang on the door and try to get them to come? You know, it's, it's, it's hard. So at the very least, we need to have some way of reacting in situations like that, meaning that we have their address, we know their name, blah, blah, blah. And so, and maybe that's changing, um, but that's my understanding of the landscape. So you can't have anonymous clients. Now, what you could do, and I know there are organizations that do this, where you're very clear it's not a clinical service and you don't have therapists facilitating, or if you do have therapists that are facilitating, you don't advertise them as therapists. You just say you have facilitators that are trained on how to lead these these groups. But, and you would leave out any mention of mental health issues um, because they call it a group mental health in this, like in the same blurb, they call, they say it's a mental health session that is not addressing mental health issues. Well, then why the fuck is it called a mental health session if it's not addressing mental health issues? Well, no, actually (laughs) it's even worse. They're calling it a mental health session that is for discussing and addressing a wide range of mental health issues. So it's a mental health session that is designed to work on mental health issues, but it's not psychotherapy and it doesn't provide a diagnosis or treatment. Then, well, then what the fuck is it? (laughs) Yeah, they're going in both directions and highly problematic. And honestly, a wide open door for uh, being sued successfully. 
any jury with uh, the right you know prosecutor or the right lawyer and the right experts would just eat, like if if one of these clients were to die by suicide or be harmed by the therapy or something and this was um, brought up the ladder of you know to the ethics board to courts this sort of thing um, this organization would have no leg to stand on just nothing <laughs> So, yeah, that's what I think about it, Arnett. And there's more and more of stuff like this, which I I guess when I think about it, now that we have the internet and we have therapy moving more online, more and more every day, you know, I recently did a tougher bluff that was something like uh, since before the pandemic, there has been a slight dip in in-person therapy and there's been this this huge jump in online therapy. So a lot more people are in therapy now and the availability of online therapy, you know, whether it's a private practice therapist or an organization that provides online therapy has really made it a lot more convenient and a lot of people are benefiting from that. So it's a good thing. But a side effect, I think, is that the frame of therapy is starting to be played with along the edges because in the past you just had this really rigid form of clinical service where they came into the office, right? It's, and you would have intake paperwork and you would see the client right sitting right in front of you. So this idea of an anonymity, it wouldn't be possible. Right. And I think that we're in a transition time, like a wild West kind of thing. And, you know, we'll iron it out as a society and as a field, in 10, 20 years from now, we'll look back and say, oh, it wasn't it funny that we were doing things like that, but we've learned not to do stuff like that. And But with that, we actually um, change that into this, which now kind of works, you know, like, because um, I'm guessing that this organization, they have their hearts in the right place. They want to help people and they, they want to uh, go where the clients need help and provide them help in a way that they're very familiar with, playing a game and going through Discord. You know, a lot of gamers, that's where they live. And so it's a wonderful mission and it could work, right? It doesn't have to harm people, but it just has to be well-defined. Yeah. All right, let's take a break. All right, we're back from the break. Let's do an OPP. These people became patrons at the end of 2021 and have stayed patrons through thick and thin. This is a list of people from the United States. We have Sad Anon from Fairbanks, Alaska. Kristen from Conway, Arkansas. A-R. That's got to be Arkansas because Arizona is A-Z, right? Arkansas, right? Uh, Bella from Phoenix, Arizona. Julie from Carlsbad, California. I've been there. Lynn, Lynn from Long Island City, California. Lynn, Lynn, are you the Lynn from TBTL? I mean, I'm pretty sure that's a common name. Uh, I'm not going to read your last name, but there is a Lynn who has been a super fan of TBTL, the podcast, my favorite podcast. Is that you? <laughs> if it is, be a small. But again, I think there's a fair amount of people with that full name. Brad from Los Angeles, California. Marielle, Mar- Marielle from San Diego, California. RS from San Francisco. Carla from. Tulare, to, to California. Sarah from Concord, California. Rebecca from Corona, California. Oh, a lot of people are from California. Uh, Christina from Dublin, California. Ross from Van Nuys, California. Francine from Valley Center, California. Angela from San Diego, California. Mary from Long Beach, California. Stephanie also from San Francisco, California. Debbie from Loma Linda. Go is from El Sobronte, California. Berto would be able to pronounce that better. Colin from Irvine, California. Anina from Laguna Beach, California. Sarah from Oakland, California. Shannon from West Hills, California. And Elizabeth from Montrose, California. Wasn't there a famous, like... And then you got Jamie from Trinidad, California. Abby from Loveland, California, or Loveland. Holly from East Hampton, Connecticut. Vatana, Vatana from Glasgow. Glastonbury, Connecticut, and Lucy from, <laughs> I look like Tampon Springs, Florida, but it's Tarpon Springs. I'm sure, Lucy, you get that all the time. Oh, you're from Tampon Springs. At least that, that's what we would have said in, in middle school and today. 
Thank you for being patrons, y'all, and staying a patron through all of this time. You literally pay my bills so I can sit here and yammer into this microphone. All right, this next email is from Anonymous Patron. She says, One of my closest friends is suffering from delusions that have escalated over the past several months. One of my closest friends is suffering from delusions that have escalated. She believes that her accounts have been hacked and that her phone is being listened to and that there are hidden cameras in her home and that drones are watching her from the sky and that cars are following her and that strangers on the street are following her and that people she knows are involved in a huge game against her and much, much more. She has cut ties with almost everyone she knows, and I was her last friend until she stopped talking to me as well. I'm worried she won't get help and will end up homeless or worse. We live in different states. She is in her late 20s and only has one family member who does not seem to be able to help. Oh, she only has one family member, and that family member does not seem to be able to help. What can I do? End of email. Yeah, this is rough. She's in her late 20s, so there's a chance that... This might be the first major delusional episode that she has gone through. It's common for people with psychotic disorders to have mild bouts of that uh, at some point building up to a crescendo of a very major episode of delusions. And your description of it is pretty classic, you know, persecutory. She's like, my accounts have been hacked. You know, my phone is being bugged. There are cameras in my home. Drones are watching me. Cars are following. Strangers are following me. And even people in my life are working for this Illuminati or whatever. And it's it's incredibly hard to watch. You just see them suffering because they believe it. Just imagine if that was actually happening to you, how horrible that would feel, how scary that would feel, how demoralizing that would be that everyone around you who you thought loved you is actually working against you and and might not have ever loved you. You know, it's really rough. And I've had clients where they'll go down these roads and it might be hard to imagine, but it can get even worse than that. I had a client who had been subdued by a hospital and he was being strapped to the bed because he was violent and He's not normally, he's normally a, a, an extremely docile, nice guy, but, you know, things were going on for him in this moment and they strapped him down and he had this full on hallucination and delusion that they had ripped his spine out from his back and that he was being experimented on, you know, like in a Nazi death camp or something. And he believed it, like believed it, believed it. And he was, uh, afterwards, after he started taking medication and was um, doing better, he was still kind of traumatized by that because there was a part of his brain that believed he went through that, right? And it was, his body interpreted that as real. And although his conscious mind was saying that wasn't real, his, you know, his inner mind believed that actually happened to him. And it, you know, it's, it's, it's really a lot of suffering. And it, our options are limited. I mean, even if we had... Uh, support in our society and allocation of funds to help situations like this, sometimes it, it's just hard to help. The thing that I would feel, and I've been in this situation personally, actually, I, I've, I've been in this situation a number of times personally, and the options are very limited. The thing that I would hope on, which is usually the case, is that one way or another, the symptoms will start to sub, uh, subside. They don't always, but they usually do. And when that happens, the individual will start to realize what happened for the previous month. And they will seek help themselves because they're terrified of what their brain is doing. So that's something that you can kind of hope overall. In the meantime, the things that you can do, and you don't have to do this because you could be targeted by the individual or it could be almost impossible if, if they think that you're working with the enemy, they could just write you off entirely and block you like they already have done to so many people. 
there's a number of different options. One option is perhaps the easiest, which is that you're just there with her and you listen and you stay in contact and you might even kind of agree with what's happening with them, you know, because at least if they have somebody that they are in connection with, that that's saying something, right? That's helpful to them. It keeps them potentially able to communicate with someone who can talk with other people, maybe that kind of thing. Maybe it's a bit of a comfort that'll get them through those times. You know, that's one thing you can do. It feels weird because it feels like you're going along with something that is incredibly scary and destructive for the individual. But that is an option. Not many people would choose that, but um, given that no option is particularly good, particularly given your situation, you're, you're in a different state, you're not related to this person. You know, family members have a greater ability to uh, exert control, you know, get getting the, the person into a hospital, that kind of thing, or authorizing, you know, involuntary treatment. But another option is that you start to build a team around, this is what I did in this situation, is you start to get in con- frequent contact with everyone in their in this person's life, their family members, their other friends, coworkers, whatever. And you just establish open communication and frequent communication. And some somebody needs to take the lead. You can't just have everyone as a flat hierarchy. Someone has to be in control. It typically will be a close family member, you know. Like for me in my situation, it was their parent, their parents, I guess. And those parents were coordinating everything that was happening, all the communication, all the updates, and the approach. And uh, because what you can do once that is established is that you, you can actually start to do things. You, you can start consulting with psychiatry and other folks that can actually advise you on what to do minute to minute. And one option that is available is that you you figure out a way to get this person into the hospital. Once they're in the hospital, maybe they'll go voluntarily, but even if they don't go voluntarily or or they go voluntarily, but they don't want to stay voluntarily, this family member can take, uh, you know, caught or can make moves even prior to that moment to set up so that involuntary commitment is available. Because, uh, that would help in an all likelihood if the individual were to be involuntarily uh, admitted to a hospital and held in my state and maybe throughout the United States, the minimum hold is for 72 hours or is that maximum hold? Yeah, I think that's maximum 72 hours, three days. And then uh, someone can go back to the court. It's usually like the, the lead physician will go to court and or submit a, a form that says, I need another week, that kind of thing. And during that time, medication could be administered. At the very least, the individual can be protected from harming themselves and other people or destroying their life, you know, like selling everything that they own, that kind of stuff. And so that's one option, but you, it would be really hard for you as a friend who lives in a different state to facilitate that because how else are you going to get this person to begin treatment? How else are you going to get this person to be forced into a facility that won't um, let them out when they want to go, right? And will provide the specialized care that is, um, you know, very comp, typically very comp, not always, you know, there are hospitals that are pretty atrocious and there, of course, are stories, but generally speaking, it's better than nothing. And sometimes it can be perfect. There, there are people that I know who uh, after being hospitalized once, as they become symptomatic, they'll immediately just go to the hospital. <laughs> and sometimes they have a hard time authorizing, you know, getting their insurance to pay for it. And it'll be very upsetting to them. They they want to go to the hospital because it's a place that they know will be able to watch them and monitor their meds and their, and their you know, biological markers to make sure that they're okay and all that kind of stuff. So, so that's what I would do. And if you establish this communication network, you can reassure each other and you can support each other. So that's what I would do. But another option, the third option, is that 
you just draw a boundary or you just stop reaching out. And uh, maybe you communicate to the family member who doesn't seem to be able to help, you know, the one family member that's in her life. And you say, hey, I'm drawing a boundary because this is too hard. I, I feel powerless. If there's something I can do, let me know. But um, I'm telling you that I can't be involved anymore for the time being. And I pray that things will get better for my friend. And at that point, I will re-engage because I love this person. But I, I, I feel like I'm not really doing any good here. So know that I am not involved anymore. So if you're the last person involved, um, I heard on a podcast that you can reach out for consultation or you can call a hospital or you can call a social worker like DSHS or something. You know, sometimes they have services as well. Um, and sometimes they'll even do house calls, that kind of thing. So you can do that. You can also call the crisis line or have the individual, uh, the family member who hopefully lives in that area, call the crisis line. Like in my area, we call it crisis connections or crisis and commitment services, this kind of thing. And all you have to do is just Google that you know, website, obviously. In other jurisdictions, they would have in all likelihood a different number. You can also just call 911 and say, this isn't an emergency, but I don't know who to call because my friend has uh, is going through a mental health crisis. Can you connect me or give me the number of what I'm supposed to call in my area? All right, this next email is from an anonymous patron. She says, I'm wondering if you would be able to speak to grief occurring from a mentor-mentee relationship terminating, a supervisor-supervisor-supervisee relationship terminating. I graduated with my master's in mental health counseling in 2020. Graduate with a master's in mental health counseling. Congratulations. Anonymous patron, anonymous patron. And I have remained in close contact with my program mentor since graduating. I recently joined his private practice as a clinician. Long story short, there was some interpersonal conflict between us along with some other disagreements of decisions he was making for the company, which resulted in me choosing to leave his practice. While we have talked through the conflict and there is not any resentment or hostility between us, I'm coming to terms that it may be time to part with this relationship after six years of working closely with him. Okay, so just reviewing here that you had a close relationship with your mentor supervisor and then you joined their private practice, and then there was interpersonal conflict between the two of you, and also you disagreed about the, the decisions he was making about the company. I wonder if it had to do with like the, the fee that he was charging or the, the cut that he was taking, because um, typically if you join a, a senior clinician's practice, they will provide supervision, and they're also going to take part of the fee, right? So if a client comes in and they're charged 200 bucks, then... Uh, he would take, you know, like 80 of those 200 bucks and you would get 120, that kind of thing. But sometimes there could be a lot of conflict about that. And it could be perceived as though the senior therapist is just being greedy and that kind of stuff. And, you know, I have a lot of thoughts on that. It's case by case. It's hard. Um, but anyway, um, and exploitation does, exa does happen, absolutely. Um, but at the same time, it is... I don't think it's unethical or wrong when they do. I'm just making that shit up. I don't know if that was actually what you're, you were fighting about. It sounds like it was much more involved in that. Because you also say that there was just interpersonal conflict between the two of you. Going on with your email. Um, oh, and, and you say that you're not angry at each other, but you're thinking, uh-oh, I think I might have to move on from this relationship. While I think it may be for the best and time to find a new mentor with a different perspective and different experience, it has been very difficult and painful for me to accept that this relationship is going to end. I love him dearly, and he has had a huge impact on my career and my personal life. Since becoming a therapist, my career has become a huge part of my life, and I have never known life as a therapist without him being a central part of it. I think we will still keep in contact to some extent, but not in the same capacity as before. I'm just curious if you have had a similar experience as a supervisor or as a supervisee. I am probably looking for validation more than anything, as not a lot of people can relate to the situation. The pain feels similar to a breakup in a lot of ways, and that is not something I would have anticipated prior to entering the field, which makes sense, but I just didn't see it coming. 
end of email. Yeah, anonymous patron, I, uh, you know, addressing what you're saying later, which is that you are saying other people can't really relate. And yeah, because for a lot of people, they're just like, well, isn't this just like a professor of yours? Or wasn't he just like a supervisor, like your boss? Who cares? The, you know me, I will talk about um, in my book and on this podcast, how important the mentor-mentee relationship is in this field, how critical it is to the development of therapists, how close the relationship is. And it does sound like it had all those elements, right? That, you know, he had, you say he had a huge impact on your career and your personal life. And that becoming a therapist has been has become a huge part of your life. It's not just a job, right? And you've never known what it's like to be a therapist without him being a central part of it, without him being by your side, without him encouraging you, without him challenging you, without him providing that emotional holding experience for you. That, yeah, it's huge. You know, it's not just a job. It's it's a calling. And he's always been infused in that. And he's been a critical part of it. Yeah, a huge part of your success and your your resilience through this process has been because of him and you appreciate that and that is fantastic uh most people in our field never have a mentor like that which is incredibly sad to me and you have which is which is great i i don't know what you were disagreeing about i'd be curious if there's a way through that and you could retain his mentorship not that you would not have another mentor also so I'll I'll just put that out there. It doesn't sound like that's possible, but who knows? But yeah, it, it's it's a huge loss. It's a very significant loss, even if you are still friends and you still stay in contact. But you scale way back. It's it's a humongous loss, and there's going to be a lot of grief, and that's to be expected. And there's a lot of unknowns. What are you going to do with your practice? How are you going to further your development? Who are you? as a clinician when he's not there? What are you going to do if you run into a problem? Will you ever have another mentor again? You know, because for some people like myself, I will have bouts of mentorship, but it hasn't been forever. And certainly that can be different for different people. But maybe now is the time when you just start having like consultations and close colleagues and not a mentor-mentee relationship. I mean, it depends, of course. But yeah. Um, and you ask if I've experienced this, and I haven't experienced this in particular, but I have experienced the loss of a mentor. I mean, Phil Cushman died, but we didn't have a close relationship for a number of years before he died. And all my significant mentors, of which there are three major mentors, and with each of them, there were times when they were heavily involved in my life, and then for one reason or another, it tapered off, but they're always in my head. You know, that's one thing you can comfort yourself with is he will always be in your head and your and in your heart. That will never change, even if you didn't want him to be in there, which it sounds like you do want him in there, but you will forever hold that with you. I think about the first time I experienced this when I first started to write music. I had a friend, Greg Hino, for those of you that grew up with me listening, like my parents, <laughs> you might know him. And he was an accomplished musician, guitarist, bassist, songwriter, this kind of thing. And I knew nothing. I've always wanted to be in band. And so I uh, thought, hey, let's form a band. He eventually was like, hey, you should probably contribute monetarily to the band because all of us musicians have to buy our equipment and da, da, da. You know, I'm just a singer and Greg had all the microphones and the recording stuff. And I was just like, oh yeah, yeah, sure. Um, uh, what could I get? And and he's like, well, you should probably get, for the band, you should get an acoustic guitar that has a mic built into it, right? That you could plug in and record easily. And I was like, sure. And so we went to this army surplus store in Redmond <laughs> and there was this guitar on the wall. You know, they would they would sell like canteens and camo and guns and this sort of thing. And there was a used, a very old used guitar, a Mateo, which is a very obscure brand of guitars. And it was $100. And I must have used like, I don't know, all my savings or my birthday money or something. And I bought it. And 
I bought it with the intention of Greg Heino playing it, not me. But I was like, well, you know, it's mine, so I'll just bring it home and fiddle around with it. And I had Greg teach me some chords, and that led to me learning how to play guitar. And, and so he would teach me how to play guitar, and then he would teach me um, song structure, and we would sit in his room and uh, write music. And I, I was completely aimless and clueless about that sort of stuff, but he knew, and he would explain, and, and he, he would also, over time because I started writing music myself he started to critique it <laughs> he was like my John Lennon and because uh, he was very um, he, he was a very dark person <laughs> and very whatever the opposite of pop music is that he listened to a lot of Pink Floyd and he he would say oh that's that's too cheesy oh that's too cheesy or that's too goofy or that's too simple or that's too pop sounding and he would say, oh, that's good. I like that, you know. And to this day, to some extent, when I'm writing music, I can hear his voice, <laughs> you know. And he's my age. He might even be a little bit younger than me, you know, because I'm a little old for my grade. And he was a mentor, and, and he's still with me after, you know, 40 years or something, 35 years. And that's just Greg and guitar and songwriting. This guy as a mentor is going to be in your brain for the rest of your life. And that, that's a good thing. So that could be comforting, right? The other thing that I'll say is that it's a good thing to have multiple mentors or supervisors because you can learn a whole new group of things. For myself, even if I just consider them mentors, because of course I've had like 20 supervisors and three of them happen to be mentors. Actually, Phil was never my actual supervisor, but... One could think of him as kind of a supervisor, but not really. Anyway, so uh, with those mentors, I had, br you know, not brief, but I had bouts with each one of them, you know, bouts where, like with Paul, uh, David, who was on the podcast, he, he's the, uh, you know, my mentor and a professor and supervisor who, and friend um, and boss, because he hired me as a professor. Um, he's the one who, is suffering from Alzheimer's and is doing death, you know, uh, what's it called? Uh, medically assisted death, suicide, right? And uh, he's actually, he's updated like the timeline. It looks like it's happening in like six months or something. And uh, yeah, I'm just extremely complicated set of feelings for me around that and mostly just sad and loss. But anyway, I had a very serious mentor-mentee relationship with him after I got my master's almost 20 years ago, or almost 30 years ago. And he was my boss at the university. He was my previous uh, professor. He was my advisor in the program. He was my mentor. He was my post-grad supervisor. We talked a lot about my personal life. He helped me build my career. He let me use his office. <laughs> He introduced me to people. So, you know, he was a, a huge part of my life in that early few years. And he was a mentor at, you know, various different moments into the future. But that was a big moment. And that ended at some point. I'm trying to think why exactly. I think I just didn't need it as much anymore. And I just naturally moved away. So, you know, that it was probably going to happen anyway. Anonymous patron is a thing, if that's any kind of comfort. Um, so, yeah, I get it. And you're saying, hey, you're looking for validation. I, I, I'm thinking I probably provided it. So consider yourself validated because <laughs> I, I get it. And another thing, like I started saying earlier, is just be thankful that you had a relationship like this. What a gift that he gave you and that the universe gave you. Most people, they look for this, they never get it. You know, they, they look for a mentor that will give them this sort of thing. Uh, oh, another aspect to this is like, well, how do you reconcile the fact that he disappointed you so greatly with the fact that you respect him and like him so much? Um, I've been deeply disappointed by some of my mentors and supervisors. And yet that doesn't ruin the relationship. <laughs> I mean, I have been deeply upset and demoralized, not demoralized, but I've been disillusioned, I supposed, of the, I don't know, 
the wisdom or the all goodness of some of these supervisors and mentors in some very significant ways. And yet I can still hold on to them. And it just is in the same camp when I talk about friends that the closer you get to people, the greater the risk or the inevitability that you're going to run into the jagged edges of their personality and it's going to poke you and it's going to annoy you. But the only solution to that is that you never get close to people, which sucks. So it just kind of comes with the territory. All right, let's take a break. All right, back from the break. Let's do another OPP. I'm sorry for doing all these, but I do want to get to all of them. And I hear from people saying that they get a kick out of hearing their name. (laughs) So these people became patrons toward the end of 2021 and are still patrons, as far as I know at this moment. Last I checked anyway. We have Shay from Val Rico, Florida. Taylor from Palm Harbor, Florida. Oh, a bunch of people from Florida. Oh, I think I organized this by by state and alphabetical. So we're we're in the Florida. Oh, but earlier I said Lucy from Tampon Springs, Florida. <laughs> so uh, Shay from Valerico, Taylor from Palm Harbor, Asia from Delray Beach, Ryan from Miami, Kasha from Gainesville, and Jessica from Sebring, all from Florida. Joanna from Honolulu, Hawaii, one of my favorite places. Kayla from, these are people from Iowa, Kayla, Kaylee and Kaylee from Marion, Iowa, and Meg from Des Moines, or Des Moines. We have a Des Moines near Seattle, and I think we say Des Moines, but we don't say the des, we just say de, de, Des Moines, but in Iowa, I'm pretty sure it's Des Moines. Anyway, Christina, oh, all these people are from Illinois. We have Christina from Prospects, Prospect Heights, Stephanie from Evanston, Ben from Fairmont, and Gina from Lake Bluff. We have one person here from Indiana. We have Holly from Fort Wayne. One person here from Kansas, Tiffany from Liberal, Kansas. We have one person from Kentucky, Olivia from Bowling Green, Kentucky. Good old Bowling Green. That's where the uh, Bowling Green is. There, there's a there's a football team, college football team, right? Bowling Green football, yeah. <clears throat> and that's what I know Bowling Green from. <laughs> and we have uh, the following people from Massachusetts. We have Monta from Cambridge, Dominique from Boston. Melissa from Norton and Caroline from Newton, Newton, Massachusetts. That's isn't that where um, that uh, horrible thing happened at that that uh, that elementary school. One person from Maryland. We have Elizabeth from Baltimore. We have a bunch of people from Michigan. Christina from Kalamazoo, just a wonderful name. Michael from Lansing, Elder from East Lansing, Megan from Essexville, and Keith from Port Huron, and then a bunch of people from Minnesota. We have Marianne, Lisa, Marianne from Apple Valley, Lisa from Crystal, Minnesota, Liz from Duluth, and Joella from Moorhead. Liz from Duluth, that's where my sister lives. All right, if I'm going to get through all these emails in this series of episodes, I'm going to have to be briefer here. <laughs> Anonymous patron, she says, first of all, I'm a, I am a pediatrician, but I, I was also interested and I tested well in psychology and med school. I also recently discovered how much I enjoy being in therapy, and this podcast is is a perfect nerdy outlet for those interests, so thank you. Ah, well, that's nice. My question is, could you provide some insight into what could possibly cause a personality change in somebody? Recently, I went through a breakup with a long-term friend. We So I went, uh, breakup, long-term friend. We still have mutual friends, and she has stated during the period of our friendship dissolving she was having major mental health issues and she was in a bad relationship and now she is out of that and doing better okay so she was in a bad relationship she was having major mental health issues and during that period is when your friendship dissolved well it's kind of sad that your friendship dissolved due to that maybe you can get back together however her values and perspectives have totally changed and they no longer align with mine her values and perspectives have told, I wonder what that means, like political or something. I do feel like shared values has been a cornerstone to our friendship. So it's hard for me to imagine that she was hiding such a big aspect of herself for the 
15 plus years that I knew her. Yeah, okay. Learning this has almost renewed my grief due to losing some hope of someday reconnecting or her returning to her old self. What would cause someone's perspective and even personality to change so dramatically? End of email. Yeah, well, it's hard to know what you're referring to when you're saying personality, and it's hard to know what even personality is. And there are people in my field that say the concept doesn't even make philosophical or scientific sense. But if we just kind of go with what I think you're using as the definition, you know, they they seem to be because it's it, it's one thing to change like your political views or you know suddenly Umberto now likes episodes one through three, but often that's just a symptom of an underlying foundational change to their personality, right? That they suddenly now don't seem to care about this group of people the way that they did before, or they seem to be open to an idea that is really counter to what you think to be the right thing or something. So I I don't know what it is that changed exactly. It could just be that they just changed their mind and their personality, so to speak, is still the same. But it's, you know, it is possible that their personality changed. The thing that I'll say is that I have seen people go through breakups or periods of time in their life where there's a lot of turmoil and they do seem to have a different personality in the end. Um, Some people can have, uh, well, it's hard to know how to word it. (laughs) Like one way of conceptualizing it is that they had an underlying personality disorder of some kind, major schema problem that was showing itself at times but became exacerbated by something. And then they started to spin out of control and they started to completely upend their perspective and their life and their lifestyle and their relationships. And they become what seems to be a completely new person. And, you know, there are different ways of looking at it and different things at play. Sometimes when you assess these individuals, like they could have had, an actual biological shift, a hormonal shift, or a brain injury shift, or something that actually results in functional differences in the brain that lead to noticeable differences in personality. You know, I I had a client once who had a, a new medication, and it completely changed the sort of things that he was interested in, or at least in one area. And it was very distressing to him and, and to his wife and he didn't know what to make of it. You know, is this the real him? Was it always in there? What's going on? And um, yeah, so it's hard to say, but from the way you're describing it, having going through a major mental health issue and then going through a major breakup. Another possibility is that this was always kind of there, the thing that you're seeing now and they were suppressing it, maybe even for your benefit to try to please you. You know, it's another option as well, but yeah, The grief is there regardless because the relationship has ended or it's ending or it's a lot different. And yeah, the additional grief of, well, we can never reconcile because they're so different now that I could never be friends with, with someone like that. You know what I mean? All right. Well, that does it for that episode. What do you think about it? Let me know. And everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do. (laughs) Thank you.